My name is Kate Sorum. Welcome to our virtual uh, wildflower presentation for Red Rock Canyon National Conservation Area. Um, just a little bit about myself. I've worked for the Bureau of Land Management for 24 years, but I've worked at Red Rock Canyon National Conservation Area for 26 years. And I have um, a degree from the University of Nevada, Reno in natural resource sciences. So just to give you an idea of what we're gonna do today, we're gonna, this presentation will take about 45 minutes. And along the way, if you have questions, you are more than welcome to ask, put your questions in the Q and A box, the question and answer box on the bottom of your uh, Zoom program. And we will answer them as we go or towards the end. So I do encourage as, you, as those questions occur, please put those in the box and we'll make sure to answer them before we're done. Um, let's see, let's tell you a little bit about um, Red Rock. Actually, let's first, let's go ahead, take a poll a little bit and see, uh, see where you're from. I'm kind of curious to know where if somebody from Las Vegas, if you're from outside Las Vegas, part of the Western United States, other parts or outside. So you're local, yay. All righty. Perfect. Okay. Um, so let's, in case you're not aware of um, what the Bureau of Land Management is or Red Rock Canyon is, I wanna give you a little bit of facts on that, but I am going to share my screen with you here. So I'm gonna share this first. It's a, uh, Put you in. Go away from me. There we go. I need that. <laughs> from the beginning. There we go. Kind of new to this text, so <laughs> have patience. All right. So, again, my name is Kate Sorm. I am a park ranger here at Red Rock Canyon National Conservation Area for the Bureau of Land Management. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about our flowers. But I wanna give you an idea of what, uh, what, a little bit about the agency itself. So the Bureau of Land Management was created in 1946. It was a combination of the general land office coming together with the um, grazing service. At the time, there were two different agencies and there was a variety of um, policies going together. So Congress decided to bring them together and make them one agency, call it the Bureau of Land Management. And the Bureau of Land Management takes care of 245 million acres um, of public land. That's more acreage than any other federal agency uh, to date. Red Rock Canyon, you have a map here of the Red Rock Canyon National Conservation Area in front of you. Red Rock Canyon became a national conservation area in 1990. It consists today of over 200,000 acres. It is west of the Las Vegas Strip, so in the uh, in conjunction, and we are part of the Mojave Desert, which is the driest and hottest desert in um, out of the four that we have in the United States. Um, so Red Rock Canyon is a national conservation area. It is not, a, it's mistaken often as a, as a park or national park. It is a national conservation area. And where a park might be um, designated more for recreational opportunities, conservation areas are designated by Congress to help conserve, preserve, conserve, preserve, <laughs> and protect um, the areas for current visitors as well as visitors that are going to come after. Um, so we are a conservation area designated by Congress managed by the Bureau of Land Management. A little bit of geography. If you're from Vegas, you already kind of have an idea. Um, we are west of the Las Vegas Strip. The mountains to the west are called the Spring Mountain Range. It is a 50 mile range from north to south. And it is one of the most biodiverse mountain ranges in all 300 that we have here in the state of Nevada. Um, our elevation on the scenic drive, which is most of our flowers that we're gonna talk about today will come off of our scenic drive. So when you look at the map and you see where the visitor center is, that's at 3,700 square or mile elevation. My tongue's getting in the way today. Uh, 3,000 feet elevation, where about halfway around on the scenic drive is the high point overlook, and that's at 4,700 feet. So most of the flowers that we see today will be on that 13-mile scenic drive or not too far from them. So whether you like to go for a hike or just enjoy the wind chill tour, you will be able to see these common flowers 
throughout the conservation area. Um, but like all things, we need rain in order for blooms. Rain this year has been far and few is in between. We went 240 consecutive days without any measurable precipitation. And to date, Red Rock has had less than half an inch, where um, as a, and in a year, Red Rock gets between six inches and eight inches, depending on where you're at. And to date, we've had very little. We've had just half an inch. So our flowers are far and few in between this year. All right, let's get started with some of our, our flowery friends. So I have put the common name on the slide as well as the scientific name, uh, most of which I will not say the scientific name because my tongue already has a problem <laughs> with saying words correctly. But some of them are also kind of fun to say. So the ones I find more fun to say, I will, uh, I will probably say them in, as well as the common name. So here we have Indian paintbrush, or it's also called desert paintbrush. Um, it's what I call a bad hair day plant. It kind of looks like it woke up with major bedhead. Um, it has nice red flowers and you will find it intertwined with other plants. Joshua trees, some of the grass, black brush, some of the other plants in the area, because this is a parasitic plant, but it's not a fully parasitic plant. It does get, it will, it's the roots of the Indian paintbrush will grab onto roots of other plants and take, steal water and steal nutrients from it. But Indian paintbrush also photosynthesizes. So it's what we call a partial parasitic plant. Here at Red Rock, they're red in color, um, but as you're driving or going in other areas, they may be yellow or orange in color. Um, also to note, these flowers that I'm showing you today, not only will you find them at Red Rock, you will find them throughout the Las Vegas Valley, out towards Boulder City, Mount Charleston, um, and pretty much throughout the Mojave Desert. So you will even find some of these in some of those vacant lots along uh, within the city limits. So you'll now have family, you'll be familiar with flowery friends as you're driving through the city. This is firecracker penstemon, really pretty plant. You can find this at Calico Basin. I was just at Willow Springs on Monday and found some over there. It can get to be about three feet tall. It has these uh, tubular flowers on them that just kind of hang off to one side and they are excellent for our hummingbirds. Hummingbirds put their proboscis right in there and take what pollen and uh, nectar they need out of them. And considering hummingbirds can move their tongue at 13 times per second, they can lap up quite a, quite a bit of that uh, nectar that's in there. Real pretty plant, um, kind of grows in bunches, similar to the large plant you see. And the one, the large bush there was taken from the Willow Springs picnic area. So do have some really nice places that you can find uh, firecracker penstemon. Wild rhubarb, also called curly dock, um, loves disturbed areas. You will find this along Highway 159, out towards Oak Creek, um, First Creek. You'll find it in the sand, real sandy areas of Calico Basin, uh, Willow Springs. Has a large leaf and a real kind of a curly or a wavy leaf on it, which is part how it got its name, curly dock. And it has a long stalk with almost papery-like flowers. They're very fragile. They're very um, well, papery-like. And they blow and they kind of rustle in the wind. Don't let the name fool you, wild rhubarb. Um, we buy rhubarb in the store. We like the stock. We make strawberry rhubarb pie out of it, strawberry rhubarb jelly. Um, this was one of my dad's favorite rhubarb. Regular rhubarb was one of my dad's favorites. This particular plant, however, <clears throat> wild rhubarb, please don't eat it. <laughs> um, it is toxic to both livestock as well as humans. If you know how to prepare the leaves and when to prepare the leaves, it can be edible, but please don't eat it. Um, <laughs> please don't go out there and say, Ranger Kate said I could eat this plant. No, please don't do that. Um, this is a toxic plant, both to uh, livestock, cattle, sheep, horses, as well as humans. But it is just one of those defining plants that when you see it, you know what it is. Okay. And again, you can find this throughout the scenic drive. Um, I find it most often near the areas of Oak Creek, those sandy areas of Willow Springs, and then along the highway between the exit of the scenic drive and Spring Mountain Ranch State Park. Globe Mallow. This one is a really pretty plant and unmistakable. It is the only orange flower in Red Rock Canyon and within the Mojave Desert. You will see some flowers like poppies and cactus flowers. It'll be more yellowy orange. This is a truly orange 
plant. It's the only one we have. Happens to be a favorite of our uh, program manager at, with our partner organization, Southern Nevada Conservancy. This happens to be Janice's favorite plant. And this one is, it's just so pretty. The bees love it. They get in there. They'll even, if they want to take a rest, because it has a cup shape on the flower. So they'll get in there and take a rest, just kind of, you know, relax their wings, take a breath, and then grab all that pollen they need, and off they go. This is also called Solri poppy. The leaves have a very fine hair on them, and that fine hair on a lot of our cactus, or a lot of our plants, all of desert plants, help prevent it from evaporating or transpiring water, helps it to keep that water inside. But those hairs are star-shaped. They're really fine star-shaped hair. So imagine getting that in your eye. Your eye would not appreciate that very much. It would definitely cause some eye irritation, cause it to goop up, um, and various things like that. So we, great plant, don't pick it, because if you touch your eye, you're gonna have a problem that you, you certainly wouldn't like that. And this is also a favorite plant that we have at their favorite flower of our desert tortoise. It's a great food source for our desert tortoises. Unfortunately, orange balloons look very similar. So if you know there happen to be balloons let off in the air and they come down to the ground, they look very similar to flower petals. So uh, it gets kind of difficult sometimes, but these particular plants, these globe mallows, desert tortoises love them. So they are excellent food source for them. Desert marigold. Um, these right now are kind of everywhere. There, I even see them in the desert lots. Uh, driving up this morning, I was seeing them in a couple of lots that I drive by and along the roadside coming up 159. Um, they're, they they kind of remind me of daisies because they remind me of daisies. My mother probably would really like them because other than roses, uh, one of her favorites are daisies. So they have a nice kind of good landing pad. You can see where our butterfly is hanging out sitting on that uh, marigold and just taking a rest and collecting that pollen. They have a long stalk and then kind of fuzzy leaves. Their leaves are kind of fuzzy. And again, remember the hairs and fuzziness on leaves help the plant not lose its water. It helps keep that water. And here in the desert, you need to keep that water as long as you possibly can. Um, and desert marigolds happen to be a favorite flower of our executive director for Friends of Red Rock Canyon, uh, Aaron McDermott. So really common, you'll find this everywhere throughout the scenic drive. Visitor center is a great place to find these. Desert blazing star, another bedhead flower for me. <laughs> um, this happens to be a favorite of our park ranger, Jim Cribs. And uh, it's a, it, as much as you can find it, it's very distinct when you do see it. It's also really rare. The best place to find this is on the scenic drive at the High Point Overlook. Uh, it likes that rocky disturbed area across from the parking area. That's usually where we can find it. Gets anywhere from six to 12 different flower heads. You can see the flower on the left has a lot of little, uh, little ones just starting to come up and then the larger photo has some that are coming, or starting to open. This is a nighttime bloomer, likes to bloom later in the afternoon and it will bloom up through the morning. So it's great for those evening insects such as our moths to help pollinate. Um, Again, kind of has that, it has a single stalk, kind of, it almost looks like a thistle. But it's, it's not really a thistle, but it has those kind of those sharp pointy leaves on it. And then it gets this flare of a flower that they said kind of reminds me of a bad hair day. Creosote bush. This is a really, I like this plant. It, this is more of a plant than a wildflower. It does get yellow flowers on it. They're about the size of a dime. When it goes to seed, they turn into fuzzy balls. As you can see on one of the photos, it kind of looks like it's got cotton stuck to it. Um, so those are all seeds from the creosote bush. This is one plant that when it rains, it, the air changes. It's that significant smell people um, just associate with the Southwest when it rains. Has that nice pungent, um, water in the desert smell. If uh, they could bottle the scent in a candle, a uh, shampoo, or uh, body wash, I probably would buy it in, in bulk. Um, one of my favorite smells. It's not one of my husband's smells, so I always tell him, don't yuck my yum, because I like this. If we don't have rainy days, and you're missing that smell, and you want to smell it, if you take the leaves, and you cup them in your hand, and you huff on them with your breath, and then take a whiff, 
you'll have that smell. That moisture helps release those chemicals out of those leaves. The leaves are a bit waxy. When you look at them, uh, if you look at them up close, you'll see they're kind of shiny and kind of waxy. Again, that wax, waxy coating on those leaves helps them to keep their water. This is a, a greedy plant. It likes its water. When you're out and about and you see this plant, look around to see if there's much in the way of other plants in, under, or around it. The, the root system of this spreads out pretty far and the chemical that the roots give off into the soil prevent other plants from growing around it and stealing its water. With the exception of maybe red brome and cheatgrass, which are both invasive uh, species uh, for grasses. But this is, you will find creosote bush not only in the Mojave Desert, you will find it throughout the Great Basin. You will find this throughout the state of Nevada, Utah, California. And it also goes down through the uh, Sonoran Desert. So this is a very wide range plant that you can just enjoy on travels when you're traveling around the Southwest. Great Basin Big Sage. This happens to be Nevada's state flower. Uh, it says this is about as pretty as it gets. <laughs> um, the, the Artemisia tridentata, the scientific name, when you look at the smaller photo, you'll notice that it has three lobes, kind of like three fingers, three lobes. So tri, three. So that's how it got part of its name with tridentata because it has those three lobes. On that same photo, you can see the little teeny tiny hairs. It helped prevent it from losing water. This is a shrub. It can get anywhere from six feet high and 12 feet wide, um, depending on where it is. It likes those sandy lots, those dry, uh, dry lots throughout the area. Again, found throughout the entire state of Nevada in the Great Basin, as well as parts of the Mojave Desert. When you rub your hands gently across the leaves or the flower stalk, and the flower stalk's the one on the right-hand side with little teeny tiny yellow flowers, um, from a distance, they, they're not very showy. So you wouldn't realize that they're flowers unless you get really close to them. But if you take your hands and you just gently touch them, um, the flower stalks as well as the leaves, and you'll come around, come off with that sagebrush smell. Again, this is one of those plants that during the uh, rainstorms, it kind of helps the aroma of the air smell just a little different. It smells like it rained in the desert. It's just such a distinct odor. The leaves of this particular plant, uh, as pioneers and European settlers came through, does have an anti, <clears throat> excuse me, an antimicrobial effect. So they would dry it out and um, make a powder out of it and use it for chafing, rashes, um, any of those damp areas, similar like you would use baby powder. <clears throat> but they would also try to use it as a hair tonic. I don't know why they would want to use it as a hair tonic. It turned their hair green. So <laughs> as soon as they realized it was turning their hair green, they would stop using it. <clears throat> so keep in mind the plants that you see out along the desert, you can use them for edible purposes or medicinal purposes if you know how to do it. Here in the conservation area, everything you can take pictures um, and enjoy up close and personal, but we do like to leave those where they are. So um, here at Red Rock, we don't, we don't collect, we don't try to make medicine or use them for edible purposes. They're for plant that we'll just let the animals deal with those. Um, so again, a nice, neat plant that's out here. You can find this. Best place to find this is the Pine Creek area, Oak Creek area, First Creek area. Um, along up towards those canyons. Desert trumpet, Areogonum inflatum. Sounds like a Harry Potter curse. <laughs> um, my sister would appreciate that. So Areogonum inflatum, desert trumpet. Again, loves those uh, disturbed areas. You can find this along the roadway as you're coming out to Red Rock Canyon. You can find them in those desert lots, even within the city has really small, tiny yellow flowers on it. But the significant part of this that you, can, that you will see when you're out is it has that bulb kind of in the middle. Um, any, uh, just think about a minute what you think those bulbs could be used for. What could they pop, what could, why would a plant have a bulb like that in the middle of it? So part of it is to help in photosynthesis. It has very small leaves, even though the stalk is green, um, the, and the leaves are green, but they're very small. So that bulb does help in photosynthesis by storing carbon dioxide. 
The bulb is also used, there's a wasp that will go in, it'll capture larvae from other insects and lay it in the bottom of these tubes. And then it will lay that insect, that wasp will lay its eggs on top of that larvae that it caught. And the wasp larvae will make food source out of the other insect larvae. And then when it's ready to come out, it'll drill a little hole or eat a little hole out of the bulb and pupate and become a nice little wasp. And then also if you were, had the mind to do so, if you were a European settler going through, it might make a good pipe or a good whistle for one of the kids as you went through. So they're green, they're starting, they're green now, uh, but they start to turn more brown in color as the summer goes on, they get more brown. And then, so the remnants of them uh, will be brown and kind of papery as you go through. But then they start to come back again, you get those orange, those green basal flowers, and then little teeny tiny yellow uh, flowers on the top. Milkweed, this is desert milkweed. This is a really important plant for our hummingbirds and our butterflies, especially our monarchs. Monarch butterflies, we do get them in Las Vegas. We are on just kind of that um, bare edge of getting those monarch butterflies. Monarchs need this as a food source as they're migrating, but they will also lay their eggs into it so that as those eggs hatch and become caterpillars, those caterpillars have a food source as well. Uh, so this is an important plant for that. Other butterflies will take use of it. They have nice little, it has that ball flower, that um, kind of that ball shape. And in that ball shape, there's individual little flowers that are more star shaped. I think on the middle picture, you can see that a little better. Um, so each of those little flowers on a great big flower. This is best place you can see this is from the exit of the scenic drive up to Spring Mountain Ranch on State Route 159 on either side of the highway. They seem to populate in that area. Las Vegas also has what's called a milkweed project. So if you're interested in having this plant in your landscape area, you can get a hold of uh, the milkweed project. You can Google that and look that up or the nursery managed by the Forest Service over there at uh, Floydland Park is working with that project. So it is potentially possible that you can have this plant grow in your yard and your landscape and help those butterflies along the way. The sap of the milkweed though is very toxic to humans. So if you have little ones or if you have plant hungry animals that like to eat green things, um, we had a dog that seemed to like anything green. So uh, not a plant you would want because the, the sap of this can be toxic. So just know that as you're going in, but it's an unusual, unusual looking plant, but pretty neat looking as well. Indigo bush, also called Fremont's dahlia. It is got the name of uh, Fremont's dahlia or Fremontii as the, science, the species name because uh, John C. Fremont, when he was coming through Red Rock Canyon in 1844, uh, spotted this. And so it's named after John C. Fremont. This is a bright purpley blue flower, almost glows. Um, from a distance. When you see this, you will definitely know it's indigo bush. It's that dark purple. Um, it does glow from a distance. It's more of a shrub, uh, shrub-like. It can get two feet to four feet tall, loves those sandy areas again, those wash areas. Uh, there used to be some places along 159 Charleston Boulevard that had some really large ones along the way, but as Vegas grows um, westward, some of those plants disappear off those spots. But this is, you can find this here at the visitor center. There's a number of plants right along the front of the visitor center uh, and the roadway. This is also a plant that if purple dye, you know, purple, the uh, purple linens, purple clothes was meant for royalty. Indigo is one of those plants that you would get a purple dye from when you were dyeing clothes. Um, back in the day when you need, when you needed to do that. So very good plant and one of, well, one of my favorites, but if I were to be honest, pretty much anything purple is a favorite. <laughs> this is um, Mexican bladder sage or paper bag bush. I learned it as paper bag bush in school. The branches on this or the leaves on this are very stick-like. They're very branch-like. Um, they're not, they're not fuzzy. Well, I guess they're kind of looks a little similar to Mormon tea or ephedra. 
uh, but there, it's not in that species or in genus. But the flowers on this are really dainty. So the picture on the left shows you kind of that reddish purple base with the indigo blue flower on it. Uh, so they're really dainty, but as they go to seed, they get this paper bag over them. So the picture on the right, the larger photo, has what looks like a paper bag um, on each of those blooms. And that's how it got its name, paper bag bush. In each of those flower bags or paper bags are four individual seeds. Now, those seeds will rattle when the wind rattles, it, or when the wind moves, the bush will rattle back and forth. And many a hiker have been a little startled by thinking they've heard a rattlesnake when in fact what they're hearing is the wind going through the, the bladder bag bush itself. The seeds in this are also a very good food source for the critters that are around. So our kangaroo rats, our desert mice, um, some of our birds. So it's, it's a good food source for those smaller rodents, our rabbits. Salvia dorii. This is purple sage. Um, this one's also really dainty. That middle picture you'll see has littler flowers. Those darker purple flowers are individual flowers on this cone that is sitting there. And they grow in a bunch. This also has that sage, sagey smell as sagebrush does. This is your spice. This is the plant that you could use to season your turkey dinner for Thanksgiving if you wanted to. It's in that salvia species, or it's in the mint family. Unlike sagebrush, which sometimes we shorten the name for, to sage, um, don't make those mistakes. Sagebrush is not edible. Uh, it will give you a really bad tummy ache, where purple sage or Mojave sage is edible. The salvia species are the ones that we get from the grocery store and utilize uh, in our food source. But it does have that distinct smell of like similar to a sagebrush, which I think is, I'm not sure which one named which if, if either did, but they do have that similar smell. This one you will find more, uh, I've seen it at First Creek, Oak Creek, Pine Creek, um, Calico Basin area. This is a, a pretty popular, pretty common in the area. So, and again, as you're taking that scenic drive wind chill tour, this is one you'll find along the roadway. Okay, as far as the purple flowers, this one is really one of my all time favorites. This is <clears throat> Desert Four O'Clock, also called Colorado Four O'Clock. The flowers are the size of a silver dollar. They're wide like a silver dollar. This is a morning blooming plant by the time Eight o'clock, nine o'clock comes around, it's too hot, especially in the summertime. They're like, nope, they close up, they're done for the day. And then towards the cooler part of the uh, sunsets, they'll open up again for a period of time. Because they have that tubular flower, great plant for our hummingbirds, our carpenter bees, our native bumblebees, um, and a few of our butterflies. But mostly our bees, our fl our, um, the flies that we have, our native flies, and our hummingbirds really like this. The leaves are green, they're kind of thick, and they're almost heart-shaped. They're also relatively large speaking, but because they're thick, that helps, again, this plant keep its water from transpiring. And as they're large and green, it helps it with the photosynthesis. That nice pinkish purpley flower can get pretty, uh, pretty large. It uh, can get anywhere from 12 inches to 32 inches, that's height wise, uh, but I've seen it anywhere from three to four feet wide. So it can grow pretty well. The seeds on this are very discernible. They're about the size of a um, sunflower seed, but they're oval and they're more shaped like a football. Uh, and when these, when these go to seed, you can find those seeds and uh, they transplant really well. So if you're Somewhere not within the conservation area, desert lot, somewhere that you've seen uh, this plant, you come across some of those seeds, you can plant those in your landscaping. You can also buy some of those seeds in the, uh, uh, the plant stores and they, they grow pretty well and pretty easily. So very good ornamental if you wanted it. They also can come in different colors. Out here they are purple, um, but the ones you may buy in the uh, plant stores, you may get more of a variety of colors.
Freckled Milk Vetch, also called Fremont Dapple Pod, um, also called Loco Weed. So the picture on the left shows you kind of the leaf structure. It kind of is more of a flat plant. It has a small little stalk that grow, that gets the purple flower in the middle one. You can see that kind of orchidy. It reminds me of an orchid and that kind of heart shape in the middle with the white. A good place for smaller insects to do some pollinating, get some nectar out of there. Um, and then you can see the, um, <clears throat> the serrated or the rather the side-by-side -side edges of the leaves on the other photo. But it does get a moon-shaped seed pod that has freckles on it. So that's also how it got its name, freckled apple pod. It has those little seeds in there too um, that when broken can come back. This is a plant you do not want your, if you have livestock, this is one you do not want them to eat. It has a neurological toxin for when it's ingested. So this is one that <clears throat> across the range, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, ranchers will try to avoid with their sheep and their cattle and their horses because it does, as it's called loco weed, it has it definitely has some neurological, if eaten and ingested in much quantity, those animals will have some neurological issues. But out here, loves those sandy places along the trail. When you're walking the trails, this is you will find this along the trail, along the rocks, under the rocks. Uses the rocks for shade and also helps use that rock um, to help prevent it from uh, losing water. And, but it's very small. Mojave aster, daisy-like, another one of my mom's favorites, um, simply because it's a daisy-like. Purple in color, it kind of comes in anything from a bluish purple to a pinkish purple. The flowers themselves are again about the size of a silver dollar. You'll have many flowers on one plant. Um, that yellow middle is really distinctive of this <clears throat> and that great attractant for those bees, those native bees, the uh, butterflies in the area. <clears throat> and a good place for them just to kind of hang out and rest for a little while. Um, this one can get anywhere from eight inches tall to 24 and a half inches tall. And I've seen this in Calico Basin, Lost Creek, Pine Creek, and some places along the Monkopi Trail here at the Visitor Center. So another one that's real common on the scenic drive, you'll see this as you're driving along. Another aromatic flower. So this is Palmer's Penstemon. It's the um, This one, just when it grows, it has the stalk with multiple flowers on the stalk and it will, it's an excellent, um, comes back every year. It seeds really well. And so it comes back pretty quickly. We have this all over the visitor center area. We'll have this in the Lost Creek area, Calico Basin, Red Spring area. And it has, when it's in bloom like this, you can smell it from a distance. It just has a really strong aromatic, sweet aromatic, fragrance, kind of rosy uh, smelling. Um, this one's a real nice one. It's also called Beard's Tongue. As you look at the picture on the left, it has what looks like it's sticking its tongue out at you. And it's a nice little place for our carpenter bees really like this. I'll be walking by and I'll, the plant will be vibrating. I'll hear it buzz, buzz, buzz. And inside it, almost totally encased, is one of our black carpenter bees. It just in there grabbing that pollen and nectar and just having a heyday. Uh, getting a little drunk on what the plant is providing for it. So native to the area, um, and it's you, it's one that comes back again, the seed pods, it's one that will come back. If you find this, you can put it and plant it as well. Doesn't need a lot of water. Um, has a nice uh, basal leaf on it that kind of does alternate. You've got two on one side and two on another. Um, so it's pretty distinctive that way, but it's a really pretty plant and you won't mistake it once you see it. Weeks Tem Mariposa. This one's a very delicate plant. You guys, I think you, that kind of, you can see that just even in the photos. Um, the photo on the left, you see the three flowers and what's a little more difficult to see is the, it, the vine-like stems. It's kind of viney, it's very delicate. Um, in the middle, it has the three petals and then kind of that yellow and red on the bottom, which again, that color attracts our pollinators. So we like our native bees, we like our native flies. Um, and they help pollinate this plant. And then the one on the right where it shows the mariposa standing upright, again, you can see just how delicate 
this is. And it is called weak stem mariposa for that reason. When it is just growing, has enough water, when it first comes out, it stands erect. But as the heat comes on throughout the day, starts to wilt and uh, get a little weakened. This you can find um, throughout our canyons as well. And occasionally along the scenic drive, Calico uh, parking lot one area, park, Calico parking two area in our sandstone quarry area is potentially areas for this. But it is, you, if you're not looking for it, you could miss it because it's just kind of, um, it's just so dainty and delicate. But it is common, you can find it throughout the area. Manzanita. Uh, Mexican manzanita. Now manz manza means little apple. And if you look at this plant, that bottom picture with the fruit on it looks like a green apple. This is of a shrub that can get anywhere from three to six feet tall and anywhere from six to 18 feet wide. The bark is the distinguishing factor on this. It's kind of a reddish mahogany color. It does, as the plant gets older, the wood, the bark kind of cracks and has gray throughout it as well. The leaves are very helpful for this plant. They do something kind of unusual. If we were to put a time lapse on this plant, which we may do in the future, um, depending on whether or not the manzanita wants sun or doesn't want sun, it will turn its leaves. These leaves are oval shaped. And so they're flat and one side and then they have a nice thin margin. So if the plant say in the winter time wants a little more sun, it wants to warm up, it will turn the flat part of the leaf towards the sun and it'll follow the sun as the sun moves. Other times of year, like in the summertime when it doesn't want to be looking full face at the sun, it will put the thinner side or the margin towards the sun and move that way. So as the sun moves, the leaves move has a small bell-shaped flower, usually in groups of three or four. Um, the bottom left corner kind of shows how that, uh, what those flowers look like. And then as they go to seed, they turn into these, what look like little apples. When they're green, um, they are edible. However, <laughs> again, know what you're eating. Um, they, they taste like the rind of a green apple, at least to me. And they're very chalky. It has a very chalky um, aftertaste, like I took a bite out of a piece of chalk. Not very pleasant. As European settlers went through, you could collect these. You could make a, a kind of a juice out of them or flavored water out them just to kind of help with some of that quench. As these grow older, as, this, as the seeds or the fruits grow older, they become red, just like the bark. They're the same color of the bark. One of two things will happen. Um, it, they're very hard, so you'll either break a tooth trying to bite it, or it will just dissolve into a chalky mess. And don't ask me how I know that. That's <laughs> um, not pleasant or palatable in any way, shape, or form. Um, so yeah, it's it, this is a great food source for all the critters that we have here: our bobcats, our coyotes, our kit fox, our rabbits, our kangaroo rats, our ground squirrels. Um, you name it. If it's got little legs and fly or flies around, they're gonna eat this. This is a major food source to all of our critters that are out here. Um, if you're out on a trail and you find some coyote scat, uh, you'll know it's coyote scat because it'll have remnants of the apples, the little apples in them, usually the red berries. Um, so that's one way to discern um, whether it was a coyote scat versus bobcat scat, is it will have, or even coyote scat versus domestic dog scat is it'll have uh, manzanita berries in it. So definitely important uh, plant comes back after wildfire pretty easily. So it is a protected plant in California. Um, and although we have one species of manzanita here, there are upward of over 40 different species of manzanita. And I believe California has all 40 of them. So, but they are a protected plant because they do help keep the ground stable. And they are one that comes back after fire pretty well. So one we want to keep around. All right. This is Yerba Santa. Um, it's funny with the kids, I always tell them it's, it's Yerba Santa, like ho, 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 Santa. Um, and they seem to memorize it. This one, as you go by, it's really good at Lost Creek along um, the old spring where the spring used to be. 
it's growing up in like three to six feet tall and it's really wide and really bushy, has very thin, narrow leaves on it that shine. They're, they have a waxy coating on them, so they do shine. That waxy coating, as you know, uh, at least know now, that helps them from transpiring, keeping that water inside. If you were to chew on the leaves of this plant, um, it would have a numbing sensation. So as uh, European pioneers came through, they were able to use it if they had a toothache or a sore throat, they would munch on it and uh, to help numb those areas. It tastes kind of like a cherry cough drop, but a little more medicine-y. <laughs> um, and you wouldn't want to do too much of it because like I said, it does have that numbing effect and you still want to be able to swallow. So again, don't taste things unless you know what you're doing. Um, this gets a white flower on it. And it's a real dainty flower. It doesn't last too long. Uh, it'll kind of blooms and, and shows itself and then comes uh, goes to seed relatively quickly. It has that nice cluster of little white flowers. And then as it's starting to fade, they become more brown and the stalk becomes brown. But the leaves are green all year long. So even without the flower head, you would be able to identify this plant just simply by the narrow, shiny green leaves uh, in the area. Not to be confused with Yerba Santa is Yerba Manza. <laughs> um, this one grows really well in those riparian areas or those wet areas. So Red Spring, uh, First Creek, Oak Creek, uh, uh, Lost Creek, any of those areas that have some relatively running water throughout the year or damp areas. So it has a nice large green leaf on it, has a stalk, and it has these six petals with a cone in the middle. The cone is made up of individual flowers. Um, and again, it likes that nice area. This is a great one for some of our butterflies, especially if you're in red spring and you're over there, you'll notice the flies like it, the little butterflies, the, it's a good attractant of our native bees as well. And then when it's done with its life cycle, it turns into the picture on your uh, right. It's brown and papery and kind of, you know, just looks like it's a dried out stem, but it will come back. So once it's done throughout the season, it kind of gets all brownish color, but then underneath it, it's rhizomatic. So that means the roots will come to the surface and create a new plant. And then they'll do that multiple times. So it grows in large patches. Sacred Datura, also called Jimson weed or thorn apple, has that nice round umbel type top. The flowers will be the size of a salad plate. They're really big. They're the size of a salad plate. Also morning bloomers. So they open up early in the morning, as it gets hot, they close up again and then they'll open up again uh, in the evening. Great one again for those hummingbirds and our, our, um, in the evening, the uh, sphinx moth, the white line sphinx moth. <coughs> excuse me. It lay its eggs. <coughs> oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Oh, pardon me. Um, so the, um, as the sphinx moth will lay its eggs and they hatch, they become great big, kind of like tomato worms, those horned worms, about as big as your index finger. And they munch on the leaves. And then when they pupate and become uh, a moth, it's the little, the hummingbird moth, or the sphinx moth, the one that sits there, it looks like it's just hovering like a hummingbird. So it's nice and big one. Gets the name thorn apple, because if you see the corner one, you have, uh, that's the fruit or the seed pod. And each one of those prickles <laughs> or pokies, as I used to tell my kids, are a seed inside that green section. So it's loaded with lots of seeds. All parts of this plant are again toxic. So as much as it could be used as a landscape plant, I wouldn't recommend it, um, especially if you have plants or children in the area because all parts of this are toxic. The, the leaves, the sap, the flowers, the seeds, they're a high hallucinogen. I have a gentleman who I used to work with long ago who this was growing wild in his yard and he was trying to trim it back so that his dogs wouldn't get into it. And he had gloves on and he inadvertently touched his forehead, went to rub sweat off his forehead and got a contact height immediately. He was done for the day. Said, nope, <laughs> not continuing. So beautiful plant, great to take pictures of, uh, was even inspired. It inspired Georgia O'Keeffe 
because that mental plant, or rather that mental picture, um, is very similar to a painting watercolor that Giorgio O'Keefe did that's very popular, and it happens to be of the uh, sacred dead Torah. Cliff Rose. Now, Cliff Rose is, if you've ever eaten a cherry jolly rancher, is what Cliff Rose smells like, <laughs> at least to me. One of those pungent flowers. Here at the visitor center, they grow throughout, especially in the back of the ad administration building. And we'll walk out those back doors towards the visitor center and you just get this whiff of uh, Cherry Jolly Rancher and it's our Cliff Rose. Um, they're about the size of a quarter. They're five petaled, they're kind of a creamy white, another sh uh, shrub or bush-like. Um, they get to be, oops, um, how big? 10 feet, yeah, they, they get to be about 10 feet tall. I knew they were big. They get to be about 10 feet tall. And then the picture on the right, where it looks like those, it's got feathers on it, each one of those feathers is a seed pod. So those feathers, as the plant mature, matures and those seeds are ready to let go, the wind will take off with those seeds and drop them somewhere. And then it'll, another huge plant like this starts from just a little teeny tiny um, seed. There's about 10 to 15 what we call plumes, the seed pods, so plumes or feathers for this particular plant. It does get confused sometimes with um, a patchy plume, which looks very similar and has a lot of similar uh, features to it, but has more seed pods in it. But this is Cliff Rose, and if you smell anything like a Cherry Jolly Ranch, you just know you're surrounded by Cliff Rose. So these are the resources I utilized um, and was and helped to in some of the research. So you're more than welcome to kind of look at that. Um, for flowers, if you're on Facebook, there's a non-BLM um, supported, non-Bureau of Land Management supported Facebook page called Red Rock Canyon Wildflowers. It's a private person who puts that together, but they come out here and they walk around Red Rock Canyon and then they go back and they post what flowers they've seen. So. Excellent uh, Facebook page on the flowers of Red Rock, but again, not administered by the Bureau of Land Management. All right, if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to put them in the Q&A. Um, also, um, John's going to go ahead and unmute you. So if you have any questions, you can raise your hand. Hi, Jackie. All right. Um, well, I want to thank um, everyone for joining. If you want to come out and help us keep our flowers preserved, you're more than welcome to look into our volunteer organization called Friends of Red Rock Canyon. Um, you can also volunteer with Master Gardeners. You can volunteer at other parks. There's a couple of different um, native plant societies as well throughout Nevada that take volunteers. So I would recommend enjoying the, uh, the great outdoors by volunteering with one of these organizations and enjoying the plants that you come across. All right, if there's no questions, Janice, are there any questions in the Q&A? Nope, okay. So um, have a great Saturday, Jackie, and uh, hope to see you out here soon. Thanks everybody.